If you boast in humbling yourself, then you did not humble yourself. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. No. Now, now, remember, his calling that he's speaking of, probably, if in reference to the apostles, you're fishermen. You're nobodies. And God has chosen the weak to shame the wise. This is why Jesus says, God, I thank you that you've hidden this from the wise and the learned. The, the people with the degrees and the big robes and the phylacteries hanging around their neck and everybody's coming to them and honoring them in the, in the synagogues as being men of God and all righteous and holy and good. And now you've chosen fishermen, blue collar workers like Peter, that you've, you've chosen nobodies to be the messengers through which your plan of redemption would come. You've chosen the weak to shame the wise. And Calvinists will pluck that out of its context to say, oh, look, that means God's chosen certain people to be effectually saved. Instead of the context is being written in, God has chosen the weak Jews of that day, the nobodies of fishermen, to bring a message of redemption so that all the families of the earth could be blessed. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth, but God chose. So there's election. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So the point... Okay, so let's talk about boasting just for one second. Understand this. If you boast in your humility then you don't have saving humility. The Bible says over and over again, and we've gone over through many broadcasts, humble yourself so as to be exalted. God saves the humble, brings low those whose eyes who are haughty. Over and over and over again, talks about how it's your responsibility, not God's, to humble yourself. Okay, so if you boast in humbling yourself, then you did not humble yourself. That's, that's an oxymoron. It's impossible to boast in true saving humility. So the Luke 18 parable of the, the publican who falls on his face before a God and says, woe is me, I can't even look to you. And he says, this man, not rather than the other, the, the Pharisee who is praying how special and great he was uh, on the street corner, Jesus concludes it's the, it's the broken one, it's the humbled one that will walk home justified. So it is a salvific text. Now, does falling on his face earn his salvation? Well, no, if he did, then he wouldn't need the cross. It wouldn't, Jesus wouldn't need to die. He could just earn his salvation through humility. No, God in grace chooses to redeem that broken vessel, that humbled vessel. So he humbles himself. He falls on his face. He says, woe is me, I'm a sinner. I can't even look to you. I'm not deserving of anything. I am broken. And God says, you're justified, you're reconciled. Now, imagine that guy going back home and saying, oh man, I am so proud of myself. Y'all just look at how humble I was. I am so awesome, I am so great. It's ridiculous, okay? Nothing like that ever happens. But yet, oftentimes, you'll hear the Calvinist accusing those of us who hold to a provisionist sociology or Arminian sociology even, saying something like, well, these people think that they've earned their salvation by humbling themselves. And so they can boast in their humility which is a canard and an and absolutely an insane type of argument brought against uh, non-Calvinist theology. Of God's choosing before we existed and choosing against all ordinary human expectation is to prevent us from boasting in anything but God's free grace. That's why it's called unconditional election. Okay, and so... I'll use a quote, and I, this paraphrase quote from Austin Fisher, who wrote the book, um, No Longer, uh, the, the Young and Restless, No Longer Reformed. Um, and he, he talks about how it seems to him that, that the Calvinists are, are more concerned with people boasting in their salvation, whereas free will theists are more concerned with a recognizably good God. Um, and, and I think that's so true here. It's, it's almost as if he's so concerned that people are going to boast in falling on their face and trusting in, in Christ if, if they think that that's their own responsibility. If, if you think that that's really your responsibility, that you could have done otherwise, that you're free to either uh, continue in pride or to humble yourself and to trust in him. If that's your choice, your responsibility, your freedom, then somehow you can earn or merit your own salvation and you can boast in it. Uh, that, that Calvinists are so concerned about that problem 
that they, they ignore the bigger problem of a recognizably good and holy God who actually means what he says when he says, I want you to come, I want you to believe, I truly love you. Um, and, and, and a recognizably good God that doesn't have to punt to the mystery as John Calvin does when he says how it is that God has ordained uh, every man's choice and desires and intentions, and yet he's still um, not implicated in the fault as, as the fault and the approver of our transgressions is 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 beyond him, that he, he, he punts to mystery, which all Calvinists have to punt to mystery on how is God recognizably good in a world where determinism is true. They don't know. Um, and, and I say that's a, that's a much more difficult pill to swallow and uh, unbiblical pill, obviously, to swallow. And we've got to continue to push back out in love and just saying, guys, you don't need this punt to mystery here. This is not something that, we, that, that is biblically supported. Um, there are mysteries within the text. Um, God's being good is not one of them. I don't think we have to punt to that mystery.